The sermon this morning is God's style of music and song. God's style of music and song. A couple of weeks ago, I preached a sermon on God's style of preaching. So we look throughout the Bible to see the different elements or the different characteristics of God's style preaching. And this week, I'd like to look at God's style of music and song. We need to base everything that we do in the church on, uh, of, as far as our practice on the Word of God. God's Word instructs us, it guides us, it has all of the information that we need and how we are supposed to operate and function within the local New Testament church. And today there are all these new styles. Everybody's trying to come out with some trendy new style of how they're going to operate their, their worship band or their music department or you know what types of songs that they're going to be singing and, and the style of those songs but what we need to do is we need to stop we need to look at the Word of God and then we need to you know examine there's nothing wrong with stopping and examining the t type of music that we have study these things out and and be sure that the style of music and the style of songs that we are singing is and does line up with the Word of God I want you to look at me here at Ephesians chapter number five Look at verse number 18. The Bible says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So notice there's a command there to be filled with the Spirit. Continues on, still a part of the same sentence, verse number 19, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So there in verse number 19, we see a command. If you look at verse number 18 there, do you think that it's a suggestion or is it a command that says, and be not drunk with wine? Wouldn't we all agree that that is a command, that that's a commandment? So it tells you, be not drunk with wine, where it is excess, then it goes on, but be filled with the Spirit. That is a command. Furthermore, verse number 19, it says this, speaking to yourself, still a part of that same command, still a part of that same commandment, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. We, in the New Testament, we as New Testament Christians, we are actually told by the Lord, thank God, we are told by the Lord what type of songs and what type of music that we are to operate or to sing. Notice right there, it says, speaking to your psalms in number one, psalms. Speaking to yourselves, I'm sorry, in psalms. It says, and hymns. And then it goes further and says, spiritual songs. So we have three things that are identified here. Number one, again, psalms. Number two, hymns. And then it goes further and it tells us spiritual songs. Now I'm going to describe and explain to you quickly what spiritual songs are. And this is going to be point number one of the style of music that we are to sing. And that is this. We are to sing God's Word. We are to incorporate God's Word into the songs that we sing. I want you to notice there that by singing to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, you are going to be uh, filled with the Spirit. It tells you at the end of verse 18, be filled with the Spirit, right? It tells you to be filled with the Spirit. Now, how are we going to do that? Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So notice when he tells you, hey, I want you to be filled with the Spirit, he gives you a way in which you can be filled with the Spirit. And he says that you will speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now keep your hand here. I want you to turn over to Colossians chapter number 3. Colossians chapter number 3 is a parallel passage with, with this. We always learn more by comparing Scripture. Colossians chapter number 3. Look with me at verse number 16. We'll see that same statement, just a little bit worded a little bit differently here. It tells us in verse 16 of Colossians 3, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. And then it goes on and says, Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So when we look at this statement, when it's found in Ephesians 5, it tells us to be filled with the Spirit. When we look at this statement in Colossians 3.16, it tells us to let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. So what that tells me is, the way that I'm going to be filled with the Spirit is to be filled with the Word of God. So if we're going to be filled with the Spirit by singing the psalms and the hymns and the spiritual songs, if we're going to be filled with the Word of God by singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, that tells me that I am going to be singing the Word of God. That the Psalms are going to contain the Word of God. That the hymns are going to be containing the Word of God. And that the spiritual songs are going to be containing the Word of God. 
That's why it tells you here, teaching and admonishing one another. Notice that you're learning something. The songs that we sing, we should be learning something. We should be learning from the Word of God. Flip back over to Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5, we'll use that one as our primary text here. So the Word of God should be included in the songs that we sing. And by singing these songs, by singing these songs, we are going to, as a result, be filled with the Spirit. Now, one of the things that I want to focus on is the, the particular types of music that we sing, the songs that we sing. And there's a few things that are mentioned here. Number one is psalms. Number two is hymns. And then following that, it says spiritual songs. And I've heard a lot of different interpretations on what spiritual songs are. And, uh, you know, today, one of the, the, the most popular, you know, styles of music, and it's even infiltrating Baptist churches amongst Christianity, would be CCM music, right? And this is contemporary Christian music. Now, contemporary Christian music, obviously, is, it, it's a very different style than hymns. And... People that will, you know, maybe that are uh, a Baptist church that's singing hymns, when, when they start to kind of move over to, you know, singing the style of music of the CCMs, they'll oftentimes try to justify it by saying, hey, this is a spiritual song. But I want to explain to you what it means when it says a spiritual song. Go over with me to Hebrews chapter number 8. Keep your hand there in Hebrews chapter number 8. See if I can find this. I actually don't have this in my sermon, but I want to give you this example. What the Bible will often do is it will give you a list, an itemized list, and at the very end of that list, it will, it will summarize that list. Look with me at uh, Hebrews chapter number 8. Hebrews chapter number 8, it's verse number 10. Actually, I'm sorry, it's Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 10. It says this, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings, and then notice this, and carnal ordinances. Now let me ask you a question. What are the meats? They're carnal ordinances, aren't they? What are the drinks? They're carnal ordinances. Furthermore, what are the divers' washings? They're carnal ordinances. God will often do this in the Bible. He'll give you a list of things. He'll, he'll name off these specific items and then at the very end he'll use a much more broad term and he will summarize the previous things that were listed you know, in that list. The previous items that were in that List. When we look at Ephesians chapter number 5, when it says spiritual songs, what it's doing is it is explaining what the psalms and the hymns are. You know what they are? They are songs that include the Word of God. And the Word of God is what is spirit. If I were to ask you, you know, what is spirit? What are things that are spiritual in this world? It is only the Word of God. That is the only thing that, that can be found that's spiritual. Of course, we have the Holy Spirit that's dwelling inside of us. But the things that are spiritual that we have access to, that, that is the Word of God. Jesus said, the, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. What is the Psalms? Let me ask you that question. What are the Psalms? It just contains purely the Word of God, doesn't it? The Psalms are just, just the Word of God. They're just the Word of God laid out for us. They are inspired by the Holy Ghost. And David was singing those words, and those words were spiritual songs. Why? Because they were, they were containing the Word of God, and God's Word is spiritual. I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter number 26, verse number 30. That makes perfect sense with the fact that when you sing them, you're going to be filled with the Spirit. Not only when you sing them are you going to be filled with the Spirit, but it says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another. So notice that, when you're singing, you're going to be singing what? The Word of God. That is what makes the psalms and the hymns uh, the spiritual songs. That's what it's referring to when it says to sing spiritual songs. It's saying to sing uh, songs that contain the Word of God. To sing songs that contain the Word of God. The major problem, the biggest issue with CCM music is that it's very far from the Word of God. It never includes the Word of God. It's actually, it teaches things that's contrary to the Word of God. It's very shallow music, and you can't find the Word of God in it at all. And when you flip through your hymnal, and I'll give you an example of this later, you'll notice that it's constantly quoting Scripture. Over and over and over again, it's quoting the Word of God, and it's quoting Scripture. I want to show you that the disciples, Jesus himself and the disciples, sang hymns. Look with me at Matthew chapter number 26, verse number 30. It said, when they had sang in hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Now, that's talking about Jesus and his disciples. So, what we do here, when we sing hymns, we're just doing the same thing that the disciples do. We're following the pattern 
of what is laid out in the Bible. It's not just we just sing hymns because we just like that style of music. We don't just sing hymns just because that's tradition and that's what's passed down to us. We sing hymns because that is the example that we're given by Jesus. That is the example that we're given by the disciples. That is what's commanded in Ephesians 5, and that is what's commanded in Colossians chapter number 3. We as Christians, we're supposed to sing psalms and hymns, and what they are is they are spiritual songs. I want you to turn over to 2 Chronicles chapter number 29 with me. 2 Chronicles chapter number 29. That's in the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles chapter number 29. So what it means when it says spiritual songs is it's referring to songs that contain the Word of God. Songs that contain the Word of God. Look with me here at 2 Chronicles chapter number 29. Once you look with me at verse number 30. It says, Moreover, Hezekiah, the king and the princes, commanded the Levites to sing praise unto the Lord. Now watch this. With the words of David and of Asaph the seer. And they sang praises with gladness, and they bowed their heads and worshipped. Now, this is many years after David uh, uh, was alive. And I want you to notice that what they commanded them to sing was the words of David. Now, what is it referring to when it says the words of David that they were commanded to sing? It's the Psalms. So, even in the Old Testament, the local, New, the local Old Testament church, when they gathered together, they sang the Psalms. You know what they were singing? They were singing spiritual songs. They were singing the word of God. Furthermore, notice that it points out to you, it says, they were commanded to sing with the, unto the Lord with the words of David, and it says, and of Asaph the seer. What's a seer? It's a prophet. So the things, the songs that even Asaph wrote that are contained in the book of Psalms, those things were not just words, you know, pretty songs that he came up with. It was the word of God. What, we, what is contained in the book of Psalms is the word of God. So he was, they were actually singing. They were just standing there. Think about that. They were singing unto the Lord. They were singing the word of God, just the pure word of God. When the congregation was gathered together and when they were singing and the chief priests and all of them, the chief singers, all of them were gathered together and they began to sing as a congregation. They weren't just singing just nice music. They weren't just singing pretty music that was just of the Hebrew culture or the Hebrew tradition. They were specifically singing the book of Psalms. They were singing the spiritual songs that David had wrote and what Asaph had wrote. Not only that, I want to point out to you, number one, so let me, let me just review point number one, and that is that the songs that we sing, they need to contain the Word of God. They need to be spiritual songs. Number one, they need to be spiritual songs. So they need to contain the Word of God. Number two, we should use instruments. We should use instruments. I want you to look here in 2 Chronicles, uh, back up to verse number... 25, verse number 25. Now, actually, I want you to just keep your place there and uh, keep your place there in verse number 25. Let's read this first. Go over to Psalm chapter number 150. Psalm chapter number 150. Psalm chapter number 150. There are some people that are against using instruments. <clears throat> Psalm chapter number 150. But I'm going to show you that it was actually ordained by God that in the Old Testament that they use instruments. God desires and enjoys and likes. God has desires and likes. He has certain things that he enjoys as far as smells. You know, he has certain things that, uh, of the incense and he would say that he enjoys that. God enjoys hearing music. God ordained music in the Old Testament, specifically instruments. I want you to look with me at Psalm chapter number 150. It says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the psaltery and harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals. Praise Him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. So notice that the very last psalm just repeatedly admonishes you and encourages you to praise God using musical instruments. So that we have an Old Testament psalm that, that encourages us and admonishes us over and over again to praise God on musical instruments. Now I want you to keep your hand there and go, go back to where we were in 2 Chronicles chapter number 29. Look with me at verse number 25. It says, And he set the Levites 
in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with psalteries, and with harps. Now watch this. According to the commandment of David and of Gad the king's seer, so this is another prophet, and Nathan the prophet, for so was the commandment of the Lord by his prophet. So notice that all of these different instruments, the cymbals, the psalteries, the harps, this was not just David just enjoyed hearing this kind of music. It's not just because it was a part of that particular culture at that time. It says that this was a commandment of the Lord by his prophets. That when David commanded this, that this actually came from God. That when Gad the king seer commanded this, that when Nathan the prophet commanded this, that this actually came from God. That God desired that they use these instruments. Look at verse 26. And the Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priest with the trumpets. And Hezekiah commanded to offer the burnt offering upon the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord began also with the trumpets. So when they began to offer the burnt offering, it says that the song began also. So they began to play with these musical instruments as God had ordained. And it goes on and says, uh, the song of the Lord began also with the trumpets. And it says, and with the instruments ordained by David, king of Israel. It tells us, tells us that that was a commandment of the Lord when it came from David. So we can see that instruments are something that God enjoys. Instruments were something that God had ordained in the Old Testament church and in the Old Testament congregation. In Psalm chapter number 150, this is not just David's opinions. It's not just music that David likes. When he's naming off these instruments, these are not just instruments that he likes. You know, God desires for us to praise him on a musical instrument. Now, I wouldn't go so far as to say that, you, that a church is in sin if you are not praising God on a musical instrument. But I would say this, that God desires for you to use mus musical instruments. God desired for them in the Old Testament to use musical instruments. God, uh, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He enjoys musical instruments. We can see that, that He is ordaining these specific instruments, trumpets and things of those sorts, you know, to be... Played. So God enjoys that. God desires that. God likes that. We are supposed to, in the New Testament, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So in the New Testament, you would be singing while holding a doctrine that says that I don't think there should be any instruments in the New Testament. You would be singing multiple psalms where, where David is encouraging and admonishing the reader to, to be playing and praising God on these instruments. God wants us to praise Him on instruments. Now, I don't believe that Psalm chapter number 150 is like a command to a New Testament church that, hey, you must have all these instruments. I don't believe, and I'll give you an example of that. If that were the case, then we would have to have someone up here praising Him with timbrel and dance. We have to have, you know, maybe, maybe Peyton, maybe one of the little girls up here praising with timbrel and dance, right? So I don't believe that this is a commandment to say that, hey, the New Testament church. I don't think this is just geared towards a command of the New Testament church has to use all of these instruments. These are just different ways that we can praise God. And, norm, and every time, not normally, every time you see someone praising God with dance, it's always like a victorious dance. It's not just like the style of dance that we would think of in American culture today. Like it's when, you know, uh, Miriam is leading the nation of Israel after they're victorious they have their different instruments and they're just celebrating and it's a celebratorial dance of, of just their, of their victory, right? And she's, it doesn't have to be within a New Testament church, but God desires to be praised and worshipped on instruments. That's what Psalm 150 is teaching. Psalm 150 is teaching that God wants you to praise and worship Him on instruments. So in the New Testament church, the songs that we sing, they should contain the Word of God. They should be spiritual songs. And how do you make something spiritual? You know, it's not this CCM type of mentality of this, this emotional, you know, type of music. And that's all they do. It's just such a spiritual song. When it's not spiritual at all because it contains nothing of the Word of God. It doesn't teach any doctrine. It doesn't, it's not teaching anything about the Word of God. So it's not spiritual at all. The way that it's spiritual is by containing the Word of God. It's not that, you, people think that it's just like if you just have emotions. If you're just being real emotional, then it's spiritual. Oh, the Spirit of God is just upon me. That's not at all what it's saying. It's saying the Word of God is what makes it spiritual. You know how to you know, sing a spiritual song? Be filled with the Spirit and sing the Word of God. And that is what it's referring to. So number one, the songs should contain the Word of God and they should be spiritual songs. 
And, and specifically, it tells us what types of songs that God would like us to sing and to command it. Psalms and hymns. Number two is that we should use instruments in the church. We are encouraged and admonished. We saw that God in the Old Testament ordained instruments. They're not prohibited in the New Testament. There's no teaching where they're prohibited. But rather, it commands us to sing psalms, and the psalms encourage us to, to use instruments. Now, is there particular instruments that we must use? You know, if you start off a church with one family or just maybe, you know, your wife and just you, do you have to have, you know, all of these different things? You know, a trumpet, a psaltery, a harp? Obviously not. Obviously, that's not what it's saying. But, hey, we know that God desires and likes, you know, and enjoys musical instruments, so we should incorporate them when we can. We should praise Him on musical instruments. God likes that and God desires that. Point number three is that we should, we should sing joyfully. I want you to turn with me to Isaiah chapter number 49. Isaiah chapter number 49. Isaiah chapter number 49. We're going to look at verse number 13. When we sing, we should be happy when we sing. We should sing joyfully. We should be happy when we're singing the Word of God. The Word of God is something that will cheer you up. When you're singing a spiritual song and being filled with the Spirit, one of the fruits of the Spirit is joy. One of the fruits of the Spirit is peace. I want you to look with me at Isaiah chapter number 49. Verse number 13, it says, Sing, O heavens, now watch this, and be joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing, O mountains, for the Lord hath comforted his people and will have mercy upon his afflicted. So notice here in Isaiah 49, 13, when God is speaking to them, he's telling them, hey, we I want you to sing, but not only do I want you to sing, I want you to sing joyfully. What does it mean to be joyful? It means to be happy. It means to be, another word would be merry. God is saying to sing joyfully. When we sing, we shouldn't sing in a way in which we look s sad or, you know, like we are full of sorrow or like we are not, you know, enthusiastic to sing even. We shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't just sit back with, with, with no uh, a desire to sing. We should be happy and joyful to sing. We're told to sing joyfully. And he says, O earth, and break forth into singing O mountains. Why? For the Lord hath comforted his people and will have mercy upon his afflicted. You know, all the hymns and all the songs that we sing, they're all about God comforting us. They're all about salvation, about the great blessings that God has bestowed upon us, about what God has done to save us, about all the great things that we should be thankful for. You know, there's so many different songs about, you know, Jesus coming, about his birth, I mean, you can look through all of the hymns, you can find so many different things of, in the ways in which God has comforted us, and we're supposed to sing about that comfort that God's given us and be joyful. I want you to turn with me again. Let's go over to Isaiah 65. While we're here in the book of Isaiah, we'll fly through some of these. I want, you to, I want to show you what a strong theme this is, that we should be joyful when we sing. Look at Isaiah chapter number 65. Look at verse number 14, Isaiah 65, 14. It says, Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart, but ye shall cry for sorrow of heart and shall howl for vexation of spirit. Notice that God's servants shall sing for joy of heart. Look at Isaiah chapter number 52. Or I'm sorry, we're in Isaiah. Uh, where do we go? 65, 14? Yeah, go back to Isaiah 52, 9. Look at Isaiah chapter number 52, verse number 9. <clears throat> he says, Break forth into joy, sing together. So notice when they break forth into joy, what are they doing? They're singing. So they are singing joyfully. They're happy and they're singing. It says, Break forth into joy and sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. Why? For the Lord hath comforted his people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. Because we have something to be happy about, we should sing and be joyful and be happy. Go over to the book of Psalms. Be the, to the left in your Bible. Psalm chapter number 67. Psalm chapter number 67. Look at verse number 4. Psalm chapter number 67, look at verse number 4. It says, Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. So why should we sing? Over and over again, why do we see people singing? It says that they are singing for joy. Sing for joy, for thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon earth. Look at Psalm chapter number 65, verse number 13. Psalm chapter number 65, verse number 13, tells us the pastures are clothed with flocks, the valleys also are covered over with corn. They shout for joy. They also sing. 
So we see joy and singing being coupled together over and over and over again. Look at Psalm chapter 81. Psalm chapter number 81. Why should we sing? Because we're joyful, because God has comforted us, because God has saved us, because we, God has blessed us and we have things to be thankful for. Look at Psalm chapter number 81, verse number 1. Sing aloud unto God our strength, make a joyful noise unto the God of Jacob. So we should sing and we should sing joyfully. Psalm chapter number 95, verse number 1. <clears throat> Psalm chapter number 95 Verse number one says, O come and let us sing. Sorry, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Psalm chapter number 98. Psalm chapter number 98, verse 4. We'll look at all these ones that are close together. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Let's look at a New Testament verse. Look at James chapter number 5, verse number 13. James chapter number 5, verse number 13. So that's late in the New Testament. It's farther back in the New Testament. James chapter number 5, verse number 13. Last chapter of the book of James. It says in verse number 13, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. And then it says, Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. So two things here. Number one, we see that you are singing when you are merry. You are singing when you are joyful. You are joyful and singing. And number two is what? Here's another time where we as Christians are admonished to sing psalms. We should be singing psalms even still in the New Testament. We should be singing psalms. And how should we sing them? We should sing them, excuse me, joyfully. We should sing them happily. Why did it say? Because we've been comforted. Because we were afflicted, but God has comforted us. Because God has saved us. Because God is the rock of our salvation. We could look at our lives and we could find plenty of things to be happy about. So when we sit down and we get ready to start singing these songs, we get ready to start singing the hymns, we should be happy to sing them. We shouldn't be. One thing that my pastor used to do, you know, uh, for, you know, I remember this very distinctly for those three or four years before I had moved to Arizona, my pastor would almost weekly, well, at least every other week, when the first song would start, we'd get into singing the song, and you could tell that it, you know, it actually was going on. He would, he would stand up, and he would stop the song. And he would say, hey, let's try that one more time. Let's start over one more time, and let's sing joyfully this time. Let's sing like you're happy. And then he'd ask everybody oftentimes, who here is happy to be saved? It makes you think about it. Hey, I'm happy to be saved. Who here is happy... You know, with all the blessings that God has given us, with all the children that we have, with all the things that God has given us, with the local New Testament church that we have, who's happy that we have the Word of God? Who's happy with all the things that we have in our life? And he'd go through a list of things, and then he'd say, hey, well, let's show it this time. Let's stand up one more time, and let's sing joyfully, and let's sound like we're happy, and let's make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And then everybody would stand back up, and every single time, you know, without fail, it sounded a lot different. It sounded like the people were enthusiastic. It sounded like the people enjoyed singing. All of us, this is the children also that are singing, we should sing joyfully. We shouldn't be singing like it's a dread to sing. We should be singing like we enjoy it. You know, even if I'm not the greatest singer, you know, I'm not that great of a singer, and I have to practice hard and be, I have to be well practiced in order to even sound, you know, somewhat decent to be able to hold a tune. But even when I sing, I try to sing joyfully. I try to sing as if I am happy to sing and dwell upon the words and think about the words that you're singing. Uh, the other point is this. We need to sing loudly. I want you to go back with me to Psalm chapter number 98, verse number 4. Psalm chapter number 98. So back in the Old Testament where we were, the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter number 98, verse number 4. <clears throat> So, number one, we saw we need to be singing the Word of God. We need to be singing spiritual songs. Number two, we need to be using instruments. God ordained instruments in the Old Testament. Uh, God commands us in the New Testament to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And psalms encourage you and admonish you to use instruments. We know that God enjoys instruments, that God wants to hear certain instruments. So, we should, we should sing with instruments. Any opportunity we get, we should incorporate you know, uh, that instrument into the songs in the New Testament. Mm. Number three, we should sing joyfully. We should be happy when we sing. We should sing uh, uh, joyfully. And number four, we should sing loudly. 
We should, when we sing, we should sing loudly. Psalm chapter number 98, verse 4, we read this a moment ago. It says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. So we need to be happy. It says, all the earth. Then it says this, make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. So notice again, rejoice is in there, but also it says, make a loud noise. And it's not talking about an instrument there. It's talking about singing. Look at the very end of the verse. It says, and sing praise. So how are you making a loud noise? You're making it with your voice. It's not referring to an instrument. It's referring to you singing. And how God wants us to sing is loudly. God desires for us to sing loudly. And these two things go hand in hand. What do people do oftentimes when they're happy? What do people do when they're, when they're joyful about something? When someone finds out about something maybe that brings great joy or happiness? They'll yell out, right? Yippee! They'll scream out and yell out because why? Because they're happy or they're joyful. You know, if you, if you see somebody that's talking real low and that's, you know, maybe not singing loudly or maybe just somebody that's just walking around and you're in a discussion with them, a person maybe that's very depressed, how do they normally talk? Do they talk loudly or do they talk low? They talk pretty low, don't they? Right? Like Eeyore. Eeyore, you know, speaks pretty low, doesn't he? Speaks under his breath, basically, right? Why? Because he's not happy. He's not joyful, right? He's supposed to be this depressed character. You know, when we sing, we're supposed to be joyful and we're supposed to be happy. And what comes with that is we should sing loudly. God wants us to sing loud. Go to Isaiah chapter number 24. I'll show you a couple of times where this is mentioned. You probably haven't seen this before. Isaiah chapter number 24. We're told this a few different times that we are to sing loud. Look at Isaiah chapter number 24, verse number 14. They shall lift up their voice. They shall sing for the majesty of the Lord. Watch this. They shall cry aloud from the sea. So notice it says, number one, they shall lift up their voice. It says there at the end, it says, they shall cry aloud. So this is, they're, they're, they are lifting up the volume of their voice. This is very loud. And what are they doing? It says, they shall sing for the majesty of the Lord the Lord. Look over at Isaiah chapter number 42. We'll see this a few times in the book of Isaiah. Where we are commanded, God desires for us to sing loudly. Look at Isaiah chapter number 42 verse number 11. Let the wilderness and the cities thereof lift up their voice. The villages that, the villages that Kadar doth inhabit, let the inhabitants of the rock sing. Watch this. Let them shout from the top of the mountain. So again, we see shouting, we see lifting up their voice, and what is the activity that they are taking part in? It is singing. They are to be singing. Look at Isaiah chapter number 52, verse number 8. Isaiah chapter number 52, verse number 8. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter number 52, look at verse number 7 first. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. So notice this is important news, right, that they're bringing. It's talking about salvation. It's talking about bringing this good news. Now look at verse 8. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice. With the voice together, watch this, shall they sing. For they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. So notice that the singer here, the person that's singing, is being equated unto the watchman. Now what does the watchman do? Just like when we, I had preached and we had, had studied you know, uh, the God's style of preaching, we saw that the watchman, the preacher, is, is likened unto the watchman, who is someone that stands on the wall and warns the people within the city, within the walls of the city, of impending doom of a, a, an impending uh, a, a judgment maybe that's coming, you know, or a, a, a army that is coming against the city. And right here we see the watchman being equated unto someone that is singing. What do we know about a watchman? A watchman is someone that is loud. That is their job. Their job is to, to uh, uh, you know, lift up the volume of their voice and to warn everyone because they have a very important message. And right here, the message is the message of salvation. It's a message of publishing good tidings or publishing salvation. What is that equated to? Singing. When we sing, we shouldn't just be singing <clears throat> shallow words. We shouldn't be just singing things that don't matter, things that are not important. We should be singing the Word of God, which is very important. So it makes sense 
that just like the preacher is to lift up the volume of his voice because it's something of significance, because of what he is preaching is important, if we are singing the Word of God, just like the preacher is preaching the Word of God, then we should also be lifting up our voice. We should be singing loudly because we're singing the Word of God. And isn't the Word of God important? Of course it is. So we should be lifting up our voice so that people can hear it and because it's of great importance. What you're doing is you're exalting that message and saying this is a very important message. I want you to now turn with me to Psalm chapter number 33, verse number 3. <clears throat> Psalm chapter number 33, verse number 3. So not only should we sing loudly, but as we saw we should have instruments and we should play those instruments loudly. God desires for it to be loud because it is of importance and we are praising the Lord, we're praising God. <clears throat> when you look throughout the Bible, God has preferences with things as well. And that may sound odd to you, but God has a personality. And there are certain smells that God likes, there are certain things that God desires. And God does things in a certain way because these can be His preferences, if you will. And one of those things that God prefers when it comes to music is is that God prefers for the music to be played loudly. Look at Psalm chapter number 33, <clears throat> verse number 3. It says, sing unto him a new song. Then it says this, play skillfully with a loud noise. If we back up, we can see that it's referring to, obviously playing is not singing. So it's referring to an instrument. If we back up here, look at uh, verse number 1. It says, rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous. For praise is comely for, for the upright. When you're praising God, you're of course rejoicing. And what is it talking about? Look at verse 2. Praise the Lord with harp. Sing unto Him with psaltery and an instrument of ten strings. So God desires for us to praise joyfully. He desires for us to praise with an instrument. He desires for us to sing while we're doing so. And He also desires for us to play skillfully and with a loud noise. So maybe, maybe Michaela you know, is, is lacking in the skillful area, but she can play with a loud noise. No, I'm just kidding. But God does desire for us to play loud. God wants it to be a loud sound. Just like when we're singing, He wants us to sing loudly. The instruments that we're playing, God desires for it to be loud. And He does desire for it to be skillfully. He desires for it to, for the person that's playing to be talented or to be skilled. You know that, what that means is that we should put time in. Those that play instruments for the church and those that are praising God, they should be putting time in. They should be practicing the songs. They should be practicing the songs. The singers should practice the songs. We should take it very seriously. Don't you think that they of the Old Testament, the chief singers and, and all of those that were ordained to play all the instruments, don't you think that they took their job pretty seriously? They were paid. You know, they were funded and uh, they were a part of the Levites and I'm sure that they practiced. I'm sure that they took time and they had like a, what you would consider a band practice. Why? Because it's important. Because they're playing for the Lord. Can you imagine if you, if you played an instrument and, you know, let's say that the Lord, like the millennial reign, the Lord is on, on the earth or in whatever setting and you had an opportunity to go before Him and to play a song, don't you think that you would practice quite a bit? You'd spend quite a bit of time practicing, wouldn't you? Why? Because it's important. Well, there is no difference here. When you come to church and you're practicing and you're playing, God hears you. And you are just as much playing and, pra and, 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 and performing you know, before Him in this church as you would be if you were right in front of His presence. He sees and hears you just as much as if you were right there before His presence. So we should play skillfully, but we should also do, we should also, uh, do so loudly. Go to Psalm chapter 150 again. Psalm chapter number 150. We'll see that this, we are supposed to play instruments loudly. <clears throat> play instruments loudly. <clears throat> Psalm chapter number 150. <clears throat> it tells us, I want you to look with me. <clears throat> we'll, we'll just begin, we'll read all through it. It's only six verses. Praise you the Lord, praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Now watch this. Praise Him with the sound of the, of the trumpet. That's a loud instrument. Praise Him with the psaltery and harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise Him upon, look at this, the loud cymbals. 
Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. And then it tells you, let everything that hath breath, breath praise the Lord. So notice there again, we see it being mentioned that what is to be, uh, the instruments that are to be played are to be played loudly. He desires for us to play the instruments and to play the music loudly. Now if we stop and we look at all of these different characteristics, just like I had mentioned when I did the sermon on God's style of preaching, and I was, and I was critiquing and, uh, you know, and, and, and criticizing a lot of the different styles of preaching today, and really the most common style of preaching today, is this soft, weak, effeminate style of preaching where men are speaking lowly, where they are speaking in a, in a very effeminate way. They're not delivering a powerful message. They're not delivering it boldly, uh, but they're speaking very low and all of that. They're not smiting with the hand. They're not stomping with the foot. They're not clapping their hands together. That was one thing I forgot to mention in that sermon. But he's also, Ezekiel's also commanded to smite with his hands together. Smite his hands together as in like clapping his hands. And we saw that the style of preaching that we see today in the non-denominational churches, we saw that the style of preaching that we see today in even some of these apostatizing Baptist churches is not what is laid out in the Bible and what preachers are commanded. It's not at all what preachers are commanded. So we can see that that does not line up with that. Well, we can do the same thing with singing. We can do the same thing with the st God's style of music and song. Number one, we can see that this new CCM music, we can see that it does not include the Word of God. And you, and you, you ever listen to the CCM music, you can tell that it's very weak, that it has no power. It's not it's not, you know, it's not something that is just powerful, that stirs you when you listen to it. It's very weak. And why is that? It's because it doesn't contain any of the Word of God. When we look at the hymns in the hymnal, they, it contains the Word of God. I want you to grab your hymnal real quick. And I want you to turn with me in your hymnal to song number 429. So get your hymnal and go to song number 429. I want to give you an example of a song that <clears throat> uses the Word of God, incorporates the Word of God. I want to show you just in some of these hymn, uh, hymns in the hymnal how much it, it does have and contains of the Word of God. Look at song number 429. This is Hark the Herald Angels Sing. So we sing this every year right around Christmas. It says, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Glory to the Newborn King. It says, Peace on Earth, and mercy mild. So right there, right off the bat, we see Luke 2 being referenced. Then it says, God and sinners reconcile. That could be referring to 2 Corinthians 5, Ephesians, Galatians. Uh, it uses that language. It says, joyful all ye nations rise. That's a direct quote from a few passages in the book of Isaiah. It, it repeats the same thing in the book of Isaiah. Then it says, join the triumph of the skies. With, an, with angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Now I want you to look with me, also let's look at verse number 3, just to give you an example of this. It says in verse number 3, beginning at the end, Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. That's a quotation, obviously. Prince of Peace is something he's referred to in Isaiah 9. It says this then, Hail the Son of Righteousness. So it says, Hail the Son of Righteousness. Now do you notice how Son is spelled there? Who is it referring to? It's referring, of course, to Christ, isn't it? Well, if you have your Bible, go to Malachi. I want you to go to Malachi. Now what, you know, your kids might do this, or you might do this, you might be singing, and notice there, like, Son of Righteousness, you know, why is that, why, does it, why is it spelled S-U-N? Well, that's because that the person, that whoever it was that wrote this, the lyrics of this song, was familiar with their Bible. And this is actually speaking about a passage in the Bible. Look at Malachi chapter number 4, look at verse number 2. It says this, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. So notice how it's spelled there. Son, S-U-N. Son of Righteousness. So again, quoting Scripture. Always referencing Scripture. Including Scripture and the Word of God making this a spiritual song. It says, Hail the Son of Righteousness. Continue on in, in uh, verse number 3 in the second staff. Light and life to all he brings. Now look at this. Risen with healing in his wings. Just like it said there in Malachi 4, chapter, chapter 4, verse 2. Uh, and then it goes on, mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die. It teaches doctrine in the very last verse. 
If you look at uh, verse number four, it says, rise the woman's conquering seed. That's showing that Jesus came from Eve. That, Je that Jesus was that promised seed that goes all the way back. That promised child that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden that was promised to Eve. And then it goes on, it says, bruise in us the serpent's head. Also referring to Genesis, the book of Genesis there, Genesis 3. Adam's likeness now efface. 1 Corinthians 15, stamp thine image in its place. Second Adam from above, reinstate us in thy love. That's again another reference to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Now this is just an example of, of one hymn in our hymnal that references just scripture. Just like every other couple of words, it's like almost quoting. And it's referencing scripture all throughout. Now let me ask you a question. Does modern CCM music do that? It's never, it's never actually using scripture. It's always just trying to uh, refer to things like love of God. You know, I'm just, I've been uh, just overcome with God's love. It's never actually getting the philosophy or getting doctrine or getting words from the actual word of God. They're not even getting ideas from the word of God. The, the things that are being taught in CCM music today and, and this modern contemporary music it's not even derived from the Word of God. It's not even in line with doctrine in the Bible oftentimes. So it, it doesn't come from the Word of God, number one. Number two, we're commanded to sing psalms and hymns. Uh, number three, obviously, yeah, they use instruments, but the style of their music is not the same style of the, the psalms and the hymns. It's very different. You know, the psalms and the hymns are almost the same style of music, aren't they? You look at the instruments that are being used, it's the same style of instruments that we use in the hymns. So you can see that these are very similar. In, in, in many ways, it's obviously very similar style of music. Now, is that the same style of the CCM music? It's way different. There's this stark difference, a stark contrast in the CCM music. It's totally and 100% different. Not only that, we're supposed to sing joyful. Now, let me ask you a question. Does it seem like, if you've ever seen, you know, the people that have sung the CCM music, does it... Does your impression when you walk in, is it just like, this is joyful? Of the majority of the type of CCM music, there may be some exceptions, but the majority of the songs that they sing, does it like, is the way that you would describe it joyful? That it's just like a happy style song? No, it's not at all. It, it gives you this feeling of like, like they're singing almost like a, a, a romantic style of song. It's a very strange atmosphere where they lower down the lights they, they, they don't sound like they're singing joyfully. And do you know why they don't sound like they're singing joyfully? Because they're not singing loud. If you remember over and over again, what was tied together? Singing loudly was being and singing joyfully. So when they're singing real low and just whispering these songs, that's not how a person that's joyful acts. That's not how a person that's happy acts. That's not how they sing. A person that's happy sings loudly because they're happy, they're excited, they're enthusiastic about the fact that they're saved, the fact that God has saved them and blessed them. So we can see over and over again that this style of music does not match the style of music that we see that God lays out in the Bible. Let me ask you this, do they play loudly? No, they don't. They turn down all of their instruments and they, they gear it very specifically to be, you know, to make this kind of like a, a, a barroom type of music. This barroom style of music where they turn the instruments down. They don't play loudly. So they don't play loudly. They don't sing loudly. They don't incorporate the word of God. It's obviously not psalms and hymns. Um, and the last thing I want you to do is I want you to turn to Nehemiah chapter number 12. And I want to look at the purpose of music. The purpose of music overall. And we saw this over and over again. Like, why do we sing? And that's what we need to keep at the forefront of our mind. Why are we singing? When we get our hymnal, when we open up our hymnal, what's the purpose? What's well, the same purpose why we come to church in, for any reason? For any of the things that we do at church? It's to praise God. It's to glorify God. Look at Nehemiah chapter number 12, verse number 46. Nehemiah chapter number 12, verse number 46. <clears throat> says this, For in the days of David and Asaph of old, there were chief of the singers and songs of praise. And then it says, And thanksgiving unto God. I want you to notice why they ordained the songs to be sung in the Old Testament. Why they ordained the chief, because we saw that they were ordained, the chief of the singers and the chief of the songs. 
And they sang songs of praise. And they sang songs of what? Thanksgiving. So what was the purpose? It was to praise God. And it was to give thanksgiving unto God. So all of, when we look at all the elements, we look at all of the elements of the way that we should sing, the things that are, that are commanded of us, the things that are encouraged and admonished of us, of how we are to sing, how we are to practice music in the local New Testament church. And then we see the purpose of why we're doing it, it makes perfect sense. And what is it? We're meant to be praising God. Do you think that you should praise God and, and turn all of the, the music down real low? Do you think that you should praise God and just play, you know, the piano real, you know, just non-enthusiastically, just slow and low and not loudly? Do you think that if maybe we're playing, we have an acoustic guitar over here, that he should just turn it down and just real low? Of course not. Why? Because the purpose is to praise God. Praising God is something we should do loudly. Praising God is something we should be happy about. Why do you praise someone? What, what's the purpose that you would give praise to someone? Because you are happy for what they have done. You are happy for how they have helped you. Why do you give thanksgiving to someone? Because you are grateful and thankful. You're joyful for what they have done for you. So when we sing hymns at our church, we do it in a certain way for a certain reason. And we do it because we are praising God. It's meant to be loud because we're praising God. It's meant to be joyful because we're praising God. It's meant to be skillful because we're praising God. It should include the Word of God because it's His words. And we're lifting up His words when we sing. So we should be praising God when we sing. So remember that. When you come in here to sing hymns, when we end the service and we sing hymns, you should sing loudly. You should lift up your voice because you're praising God while you sing. And God hears you. It's something to keep in our minds. God is listening to you. And God is looking down. And He can see whether you're sincere in your heart. He can tell whether you're actually wanting or desiring to praise Him. So we should lift up our voice and we should praise God loudly. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you that everything is laid out, dear Lord, and uh, we can study the scriptures and we can put together a perfect picture of how we are to praise you, how you want us to praise you, uh, whether we should or shouldn't include instruments, uh, just every aspect and every element, and we can, we can see what style of music and what style of song that you desire and that you have ordained for us uh, even still in the local New Testament church. We love you. We ask you that you be with us. Uh, bless the rest of the day. Bless the service this evening. Uh, be with the Hall family that they might feel better, dear Lord, uh, whatever they're going through. And we ask you to bless all the families that are here. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. All right, at this time, let's open up our hymnal and turn to song number 129. Song number 129. <clears throat> Rock of Ages. Again, that's song number 129. Let's sing it out in the first verse. Rock of Ages. <clears throat> From wrath and make me pure. Could my tears forever flow? Could my zeal no longer know? These for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. In my hand, no price I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling while I draw this fleeting breath when mine eyes shall close in death when I rise to worlds unknown and behold thee on thy throne rock of ages cleft for me let me hide myself in thee Amen. Thank you for coming. You are dismissed.